welcome to this brief introduction to the history of violin making. It is the year 1635. The people of Italy are slowly coming to terms with the terrible events of the previous years. Famine hit the area in 1628, followed two years later by an outbreak of plague, which had spread from England to Italy, killing almost half the population of Milan, Parma, and Bologna, and bringing the Venetian Republic to its knees. The northern towns of Cremona and Brescia were also grimly affected, and in addition to the devastating cost in lives and ensuing economic turmoil, the historic tradition of violin making was almost lost even before its greatest years. Its very existence stood on a knife edge, literally on the knife edge of one man, Niccolo Amati, the only accomplished maker in Italy to have survived the ravages of, the, of this disaster. Fortunately, Amati lived long enough to teach this knowledge to a new generation of makers, giving birth to a century of violin making history is unlikely to forget. The first violins appeared in the early 1500s, having evolved from the medieval viol family of stringed instruments. The placement of sound holes and ratio of body measurements appear to be based on the golden mean, and the head or scroll as it's known on the Fibonacci sequence devised by the 12th century mathematician Leonardo Pisano. Besides from advancements in string technology and the development of secondary parts, such as fingerboard, bridge, and bass bar, the essentials have changed a very little since. Through the centuries, violin makers have tried to improve on the on basics, but the margins are very narrow before it does not look, or indeed sound, like a violin. It cannot be too long for the average arm length, and the body must be shaped like an hourglass to allow the bow free access to the strings. But the real story begins in around 1560, with the makers Gaspara de Salo in Brescia and Andrea Amati in Cremona, creators of some of the oldest surviving instruments. The Brescian and Cremonese approach to violin making differed greatly. <coughs> Physically, the Brescian violins are generally larger than their Cremonese counterparts, compact in form rather than stylish in curve of outline, roughly made in comparison with the delicate craftsmanship of the Cremonese. But both De Salo and Amati produce violins with supreme varnish and tremendous sound quality many of which are still in use today, over 450 years later. Gaspar de Salo died in 1609, having taught his craft to several students, Paolo Migini being the most renowned. Andrea Amati, who worked in Cremona until about 1575, was assisted in later years by his son Antonio and also Gimalamo, who in turn passed the family tradition to his son, Niccolo Amati. In the 1620s, all looked well, and the art of violin making was set to flourish, but with the arrival of plague, or Black Death, as it was so affectionately called, everything changed suddenly and dramatically. Had Niccolo Amati succumbed, his masterpieces, and that of Bagonzi, Guarneri, Ruggeri, and Stradivari would never have been created. Niccolo Amati was born in Cremona in 1596, and is considered to be one of the greatest makers ever. His instruments are certainly on a par with Stradivari, at least with beauty and finish. In the aftermath of the recent tragedy, and indeed with the awesome responsibility resting on, on his shoulders, Amati established a workshop that would secure the future of Cremonese violin making. We know he was working again in 1638 because the astronomer Galileo wrote a letter from Florence that year with the aim of purchasing a violin for his nephew. Unfortunately, Amati took too long making the instrument, claiming that it could not be brought to perfection without the strong heat of the sun. So Galileo took his money elsewhere and bought an old violin instead. In 1641, Amati employed his first apprentice, Andrea Guarneri, and later, among others, the legendary Antonio Stradivari. It is generally accepted that Stradivari was born in 1744, 
although no birth certificate has ever been dis discovered to corroborate this. The year 1744 is taken from violence he made later in his career, where, on a few internal labels, the labels that state the maker's name, place, and date of construction, Stradivari wrote his age at that particular time, and from this information, we deduce he was born in 1744. It is indeed fortunate he took the trouble because the surviving records pertaining to his life are extremely confusing. For instance, the census returns for 1668 state he is 28 years old and therefore born in 1740. However, 10 years later, he is registered with the age of 29, just one year older, suggesting now that he was born in 1749, not 1740. Now, going back to 1668 again, his wife, Francesca, is noted as being two years younger than him, but in 1681, he claims that she is three years older. So I guess the hard work of bringing up children was finally taken its toll. On the day Stradivari was buried, the parish priest of the Church of San Matteo wrote, in the year of our Lord, 1737, on the 19th day of December, Signora Antonio Stradivari, having died yesterday, aged about 95 years. And note, about 95 years. So even at his funeral, no one seemed to know how old he was. The reason for the absence of Stradivari's birth certificate undoubtedly lies with the 1630 outbreak of plague. The Kremlin's were thrown into turmoil, and two-thirds of, of the inhabitants, including priests and registrars, were forced to leave the city and seek refuge in the surrounding villages and countryside. Only five to ten years later did livelihoods and the local economy return to any sort of order. It seems that Stradivari's parents, Alessandro and Anna, also fled the city, never to return as no census records relating to them after the year 1628 exists. And perhaps... So let us assume he finished his studies around 1666 and then established his own studio and worked full time as an independent maker. But then we would expect to see a large body of work labelled Antonio Stradivari from this moment on. But between 1666 and 1680, there are only 20 surviving instruments. And even allowing for loss and attrition, the output over these 14 years is extremely low for a full time maker. The other theory is this, in 1667 Stradivari got married to his first wife and moved into a house owned by the woodcarver and inlayer Francesco Pescaroli, who occupied the ground floor of the house. It is often surmised that Stradivari worked for him as an assistant woodcarver and inlayer and in his spare time made just one or two instruments a year. An idea supported by two instruments made in 1677 and 79, the so-called Sunrise and Hellier violins, 
and a decorated front, back and sides with elaborate inlay of ebony and ivory. An amazing achievement and a skill he probably learned in any case from Pascaroli. We will never know, but there might be another explanation. In the final years of Amati's life, the quality and instruments produced by the Amati workshop never seriously declined. And it's difficult to imagine a man in his 80s sustaining such a level of excellence entirely alone. Besides his son, Girolamo, who was not blessed with the artistic powers of his father, the workshop must have employed several accomplished assistants. Certainly, Francesco Ruggeri was one, as he was found trying to sell an Amati violin as his own work and was subsequently taken to court in 1685. So looking at all the evidence, I believe Stradivari was simply loyal to the master and worked alongside him until his final demise. And as we therefore might expect, it is only upon Amati, Amati's departure can we count the huge increase in the number of instruments labelled Antonio Stradivari. In 1680, with wife and five children, Stradivari moved into a house on Piazza San Domenico, where he would remain until his death. Niccolò Amati dies in 1684, aged 86, and now with a growing reputation, Stradivari fully embarks on his own career, and one that would endure for a further 53 years. For the remaining decade, he continues to build violins based on the Amati model, but with increasing boldness of form, adding strength in both structure and tone. His output increases dramatically. The next six years furnish us with 55 violins and six cellos. Stradivari is now in the prime of life and has reached the, the plenitude of his powers. Recognition and international acclaim come in 1685 with an order for a set of instruments from King James II of England. This period culminates in 1690 with arguably the most exquisite instrument to come from his hands, the violin known as the Tuscan. Throughout his life, Stradivari was constantly restless, driven to inquire, question, and experiment. The year 1690 records the most complete innovation regarding the construction and proportions of his violins. Partly influenced by earlier Brescian concepts, Stradivari lengthens the body and reduces the width, attaining clarity in tone and elegance of form, a model he stayed with almost without exception until 1700. The instruments made during this period are known as the long patterns, and as he produced over 80 violins with this new design, we can assume he was convinced by their merits. However, the musicians at the time were not so enthusiastic and preferred the earlier Amati instruments, so that subsequently they remained more expensive to acquire. Even today, musicians view long patterns with a similar indifference, despite the clarity of sound and graceful lines, the extra length of body does not find much sympathy with the player. However, many violin experts maintain these violins are greatly underestimated and the time to be fully appreciated has yet to come. In 1698, Stradivari's wife, Francesca, dies, but soon after, he is walking up the aisle with his second wife, Antonia Zambelli, with whom he has four children. Evidently, this is a pivotal moment in his life, not only have there been major upheavals privately, but it is a consequential moment in his career. The instruments make significant advances, and for the first time, the hands of assistants play a role in the workshop production. His two eldest sons, Francesco, now 29 years old, and Navona, 21, having apprenticed with their father, are now given a more important role. But as we cannot see their individual characteristics in the finish of instruments until much later, we can assume they were only given responsibility for the rough work, leaving their father to refine the edges, inlay the purpling, cut sound holes, and go over the fine detail with his sharp eye. The new design makes a departure from the long, narrow, and flatter long pattern form and reverts back to the fundamentals of the Marty. Perhaps this second abrupt change in direction was due to the enduring success of his and Amati's earlier violins, or the muted response to his long patterns 
maybe his sons had to sit the old man down and say, look dad, give up the long pattern thing. Possibly it was all of the above, but one thing is for sure. Now at the age of 56, his desire to search and research, to discover and rediscover, still had the impertinence of a 16 year old. Over the next four years, he would finally tune all his knowledge, experience, and conce conceive a design so perfect it has yet to be battered. In 1704, he built a violin known as the Betts, which marked the beginning of a glorious era. This model was indeed so successful that even though his spirit of innovation would never yield to complacency, he deviated little from this format. Over the next 20 years, he created his finest instruments. It is the golden period. There are few words worthy of the stunning beauty of a golden period instrument. The finest materials used for construction, the back sides and scrolls of the most handsome maple, flamed with a broad curl of striking appearance and unsurpassed <coughs> in acoustical properties. The masterly cut of sound holes, precision of inlay and execution of corner work the exquisite varnish of warm orange or red tint, sparkling as though it was still in liquid form. All and one for the conciseness of form and grandeur of the entirety. It is true to say that violins produced during the Golden Period are the most sought after by musicians, as they embody the, the perfect combination of power and ease of response. The sound has the quality and clarity to rise above the largest orchestras and an intensity heard in the last row of any concert hall. The sensation of playing such a violin can be likened to driving a Ferrari when all others are Fiat Pandas. It is to shade a musical phrase in colours when all else is black and white. The vitality of string response, the immediacy of articulation, and when playing a concerto, it seems these violins already know the repertoire. I have referred to some Stradivari instruments by name, and just about all have one. Most were christened by the first world-renowned experts, the Hills of London, who were, who were revered for many generations. It was at the peak of their standing in the latter part of the 19th century, a time when almost every Stradivari sold went through their shop, but the instruments got their titles, usually for auspicious collectors or famous musicians who past <coughs> or present were associated with that particular instrument. The Medici, Baron Canute, Bonaparte, the Duke of Cambridge, Castelbarco, de Chaponet, and Davidoff. The ex hyphets Olabul, Paganini, Wienowski, and Vieton, to name just a few. However, there is a violin made in 1683 called, rather curiously, the Madame Bastard. So perhaps the hills of London had a client in France who they looked less than favorably upon. <laughs> in terms of quality and sound, the choice of materials, it can be said that the golden period peaked around 1714, and one violin stands out alone from this period. The famous violin, the most famous violin in the world, the Messiah. There was a man called Luigi Terizio, who was born in 1790 and lived in a farmhouse in Piedmont. He was a carpet dealer with a passion for violins and a keen eye to match, and used his business talents to acquire fine Italian masters. He often went to Paris to do deals with the Parisian dealers, particularly the eminent Jean-Baptiste William. On each visit, Terizio spoke of one untouched Stradivari, which he had at home in Italy, but always promised to bring it on his next visit. For we impatiently waited its arrival, but Terrizio always had some excuse for not bringing it to France. While singing the wildest praises for this perfect violin, for we son-in-law explained, your violin is like the Messiah, one who always expects him, but he never appears. And to this day, the violin has kept that name, and since 1939, it has been exhibited in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. In October 1854, upon, upon hearing of Terizio's death, William made very hastily to the farmhouse in Italy and purchased from Terizio's brother the entire collection, 
including the Messiah, 20 other Stradivaris, and a further 140 masterpieces for just 8,000 francs. Quite a good deal. Such a collection today would be worth in the region of 200 million American dollars. And that's not including the priceless Messiah, which has acquired such iconic status, not just because of its perfect condition, but also because of the controversy surrounding its authenticity. For over 150 years, there has been a contingent of disbelievers who doubt it is the work of the Master. Some believe that while in the possession of William, he made a copy, and that copy was later sold to the Hills of London, who bequeathed uh, this particular instrument to the Ashmolean Museum. There was indeed some unusual characteristics to the violin, but despite Wynne's considerable abilities as a maker himself, it is difficult to seriously entertain the idea it is of French origin. 